their submissions letter. So uh, I wrote to her, and she decided to come in spite of that. <laughs> and um, we began to work together. She was, to my reckoning, uh, not only one of the first students in the school to pursue the philosophy of religions in what Paul Griffiths then called, I think in a charming phrase, a properly comparative way, <laughs> but I believe the only woman in that early group. And uh, handled both of those challenges, mainly being a new program and, and also being the only person representing gender diversity with characteristic race and mom and birth and intelligence. And the rest of her career since then has really described the same thing. Um, she taught at um, Transylvania University mm-hmm. in Lexington, Kentucky for eight years and is now at Wilford College in Spartanburg, North Carolina, which is in the um, and she's won teaching awards in both places, which just shocks me. I can't believe that um, along the way there. She's also the associate provost there now, for which she just told me she only gets a one course reduction. And I said we could talk later about that. <laughs> um, I can't resist uh, reading a few titles to you, which I think are indicative of the kind of thing you're going to hear today in the light of me. Um, a couple of them are, I think, just wonderful. Um, and, and many of them are revelatory, but I'll read a few. So forgive me. My life is an overly caffeinated dog, which was part of the teaching religion section of the American Academy of Religion uh, in a session titled Dogs and Deceivers, and that of course informed the practice of teaching. So she chose to be a dog rather than a deceiver. Um, right above that is one called On Breasts and Bones, Feminine Liminality in 21st Century American Popular Culture. I haven't heard that one. Um, there's also by his wounds we have already been obtained, Tiger Woods, the Masters and Rituals, Celebrity Disgrace, which is a great uh, uh, Bridging the Divide, using scholarship on teaching and learning in college introductory religion courses. Beyond tolerance, assessing multi-faith understanding, interfaith cooperation, religious pluralism on college campuses. And most recently, etch a sketch religiosity, <laughs> redrawing, redrawing the lines of self during the college years, and 911 change. Post traumatic religious studies classroom. I can't do much better than that. You seem to be our guest. We have Jane Beck Jones. Welcome. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate all of that. And because this is being videotaped, I think, which makes me just irrationally anxious, um, I should mention I was at Pennsylvania for, for four years. But yeah, Karen Simmons just graduated from Walford last spring and won our departmental award and wrote an honors thesis in religion and also wrote an honors thesis in history and just general moral So anyway, thought I would make you feel awkward. What the rest of the didn't tell you about was one of my um, days of the existential angst here at the Divinity School. I'm sure it doesn't feel like that at all anymore to any of you. But um, uh, when I, I came in thinking I wanted to do one type of thing, and I wanted to work with um, any of those texts, and I wanted to study Hinduism as well. And um, and I was in, in one class that dealt with the types of texts I wanted to be reading, and the things you were talking about were really interesting, but it wasn't the types of questions I wanted to be asking. And I thought, I didn't even know if I'm in the right place. I don't, and so I audited the class in um, human development, and I, you know, I was just wandering all over the place and just trying to <laughs> figure things out. And one day, I, I don't even know what triggered it. I don't remember the specifics. All I remember was going into the University Gardens office, and I'm, um, uh, and he was so kind. And there's something about when someone is being kind when you're feeling a little vulnerable and trying to act like you're not feeling vulnerable that at least for me it makes me burst into tears, which I did. Um, and I would say some some people are, are lovely, elegant weepers. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It was just an ugly, red face, nasty nothing. Um, and he just didn't start to sweat. And at one point, I could have given some tissues and I talked to him. <laughs> and he was and accumulating this like snow bank. He was very quietly hands me his trash. You don't remember that. You don't remember that. It never happened. 
the day before my colloquium, I was driving, I was staying with a friend up in Skokie, and I was driving down Lakeshore Drive, listening to my CDs of Broadway show tunes, singing at the top of my lungs, having a great time. Mm-hmm. So I had that on the radio. Um, and I got to <clears throat> campus and um, found out that it's this, and the day on which I was driving down here was September 11, 2001. And so I didn't know when I got here about what had just happened. Um, and I got to campus and went to talk to Dean Sullivan, one of the Sullivans, the Dean students at this point. And she told me, and my husband was in um, was in Washington, D.C. at the time, with a, a group of students in high school teacher. They were you know, right. It was really stressful, I guess, at the point. Um, and my girlfriend was the next day. And that, the, the timing of that, um, has pretty much determined my entire career. So, I went on the job market in, you know, right after September 11th. And one thing that, I mean, we were right after September 11th. And one of the things that the AR did at the time was a survey of the number of colleges and universities across the country that had any kind of program in Islam. And it was, it, there are all sorts of interesting historical reasons for why I think it's the first, but they were very, very few. So, not surprisingly, um, and there were no songs that were here at the time of the school itself. So most of the jobs for which I was interviewing were sort of um, religions of the world types of things, or jobs in Asian religions in the country. But every single one of the jobs said, we want you to get a future course on you know, Asian religions and that kind of stuff. We create a course on Islam. All of them. Um, now, as you can imagine, I mean, I have, I have been reading the Abdon Kosha for years, and that, but when people ask if I could do that, I was like, of course I could do that. Because I wanted a job. Um, and so, uh, so I, I got a job and I had to create this course. And just think for a moment about trying to figure out what in the world you would cover in that course at that time period um, in, in a field which you know virtually nothing about. So I um, applied for an NEH Summer Institute on, uh, it's called the Legitimation and Transformation of Early Islamic Studies, colon something. Um, it was here, actually, for six weeks, and Fred Honor um, was one of the leaders of it, and I loved it, a crash course, and people were very generous in helping me construct this syllabus and think about the limited challenges of what I was going to be going to be doing. Um, and so, small little arts college in Kentucky, um, many first generation students, um, and again, all coming into this course on Islam, um, which even if it were not a broad time in history, would have been challenging as, as I'm sure you're noticing in terms of constructing these syllabus. <laughs> what do you what do you cover? Um, if, if it's in a depending on whether it's an introductory level or, or upper division, if this is students who one shot um, at this. I, I thought, you know, ideally I would have a three four sequence and one would be a religion professor, one would be a history professor, and one would be a political science professor. But we're not going to do that. So um, so that was that was fun. Um, I, I'm going to actually, at the risk of, of warning you from reading to you, I'm just going to read you the first few pages of um, a document that the American Garden referenced a minute ago. The 9 11 uh, changed things, the post traumatic religious studies classroom. This is, um, is going to be part of the book. Uh, being edited by Shelly Rambo, who's at the Boston University School of Theology. Um, and she's the one who coined the phrase post-traumatic, um, uh, post-traumatic theology. Again, not trained as a theologian, so I'm just jumping into all these areas where I feel like I'm utter fraud all the time. I'm comfortable with it now. Mm-hmm. Um, but to talk specifically about classroom stuff within this. So she was asked to write it to focus on what role public theology had in terms of in moments of national crisis or in, in, in a multi-religious context. 
And she kind of threw up writing it because she had been writing about trauma a lot. And she was sort of tired. Um, and then the Boston Marathon bombing happened. Um, and she wrote the proposal for the book that day when they were not allowed to leave the building while uh, all that was going on in her office. And she basically, that's, that's how this book came together. Um, so let me just read you a little bit of it because I think it, it sets up the context um, for how we ended up with this course. Um, and I, it's, I'm not going to read all of this, so I'll um, September 11, 2001 changed the religious studies classroom. Especially in the days and months that immediately followed, people were disoriented, frightened, and not really sure what they were, what they were supposed to do next. Both public discourse and people's private understandings of themselves and of the world they lived in were shaken by the initial public trauma of 9-11 and its aftermath. One of the primary foci of public discussion was, of course, the subject of religion and the horrors to which it can lead. Therefore, it wasn't at all surprising that the sadness, anger, insecurity, and confusion spurred by 9-11 affected the pedagogical tenor of the religious studies classroom. The atmosphere of desperate and hyperbolic public discourse on religion characterized the landscape in which I began my first job as an assistant professor of religious studies in September of 2002. As I worked over the summer to plan my classes, I couldn't help but wonder what a post-traumatic religious studies classroom would look like and how I should approach my own role within that context. Already a potentially tricky topic to approach in a classroom setting the subject of religion was now particularly highly charged. I wondered if the post-9-11 atmosphere would inhibit classroom discussion, or alternatively, if it might make things so tense that people would have a hard time actually listening to each other and engaging ideas. I hoped that rather than letting the shadow of 9-11 shut down our straitjacket conversation, I could foster an atmosphere in which our shared sense of brokenness might allow us to shake off some of the cloaks of ego and insecurity that can hinder engagement with others and prohibit the type of vulnerability that often serves as a precursor to open-hearted listening and real learning. The question, of course, was how to do that. Trained neither as a pastor nor as a theologian, I felt vastly unprepared to address the very real human needs that thickened the air of the classroom. I knew, though, that I really had no choice. As I reflected on those early teaching days, I realized that the trauma of 9-11 surfaced and brought in sharp relief three factors that bore and continue to be at play in the religious studies classroom. Factors that are crucial in shaping interactions between teachers and students, especially in a post-traumatic context. In retrospect, I don't think these factors were created by 9-11. They were already there, perhaps in nascent form, more deeply rooted beneath the surface of conversation. The trauma of 9-11 simply made them more active in the classroom, like molecules that move more quickly and heat it up. The post-traumatic context also made it harder, sorry, much harder, for me to ignore their presence, even when I hadn't quite put my finger on what they were and what was going on. Each factor had to do with identity formation and classification. Specifically, with how we think of ourselves and how we think of others in relation to our sense of place in the world. The first had to do with how I classified myself, and it mapped onto what could best be described as the religious studies theology split within the academy itself. This split affects how scholars think of themselves and think of what kind of pedagogical stance they should assume in the classroom. Scholars of religion who self-identify as theologians and those who do not have deep-seated reasons for placing themselves into these categories. These self-classifications shape scholarly identity, how scholars envision themselves, and how they want others to envision them. What I didn't realize at first, though, was that the extent to, was the extent to which these self-identifications also shape our identities as teachers. They serve as the mold in which the heuristic lenses of our classrooms take shape. And of course, institutional context has an enormous amount to do with that as well. The second factor that I think was already at play in 2002, although it was not yet labeled as a sociological trend in the way that it has been recently, was the increase in the number of students who might today self-identify as a nun, right, N-O-N-E, 
as someone who is spiritual but not religious, or as someone who finds resonance within more than one religious tradition. Recent data compiled by, the, by institutions such as the Pew Research Center and the Public Religion Research Institute show a marked shift in recent years, at least in the United States, in the ways people conceptualize their religious identities. Much of the shift seems to be generational. In other words, many of the people who seem to be identifying less with traditional religious institutions are in the undergraduate age bracket. Whether the escalation of this trend has been in part an unconscious response to 9 11, or whether the increase in numbers has merely been coincidental, I'm not sure. Either way, though, I think that whatever impetus has been leading more and more people away from identification with traditional religious institutional formations was already at play pre 9 11. Perhaps the disorienting nature of 9 11 catalyzed it. It certainly made me more aware of the fact that something was going on in terms of what the word religion meant to my students. The third factor also had to do with disorientation, but in a different way. College is a place to which many students come in a state of what we might be thought of as developmental disorientation. They're searching to figure out who they are, and so might feel like they are living in between various identities, partially self-identifying with several different categories of being, but not entirely assenting to any in particular. Young adulthood is characterized by many things, but a sense of alienation is quite common. As people grow up, they often face a period of disillusion that accompanies the unseating of childhood perceptions about their families, their economic class, their ethnicity, their gender, etc. In this next section, I'm just going to read three pages of um, It's called The Lay of the Land, The Religious Studies Theology Split, Hybrid Religiosity, and Identity Formation. It might seem that the concerns surrounding the religious studies theology split constitute a discipline-specific, esoteric, oriented towards experts set of issues that really wouldn't have an impact on the concrete practicalities of the classroom. However, I couldn't help but wonder how my graduate school training, firmly planted on the religious studies side of the fence, had prepared me for the tenuous context of an undergraduate classroom studying religion in the aftermath of a public tragedy, one confusingly and painfully inflected with religious discourse. Issues of religious difference and similarity, of violence and healing, of societal cohesion and divisiveness, transformed my pedagogy post-9-11. They shifted from being theoretical issues off in the background, behind the information and data I was going to impart to my students, to being the primary answer to the who cares questions underlying my teaching. In other words, 9-11 made me think long and hard about the types of questions around which the learning outcomes of my courses might be conceptualized. The broader meaning of life issues exploded into pressing practical questions being posed to me, both implicitly and explicitly, by classrooms full of disillusioned, frightened, disoriented students. The world had changed for them overnight. Messages of fear and hatred peppered them everywhere they turned. But at the same time, they were being told of the importance of healing and of resilience. I realized they would be looking to me, their religion professor, for some sort of answers to the question of what had happened. What was the deal, really, with religion if it had been the very thing that had led to all of this pain? The question that I faced as a teacher then was this. What practices might characterize the religious studies classroom such that the vulnerable contexts of students could be treated with an ethic of care? Was there a way to provide the space for students to begin looking at their own wounds in a way that didn't exacerbate their sense of vulnerability, while at the same time not creating an atmosphere of proselytization for a particular position or tradition? My own academic training was oriented toward an effort to understand the philosophical claims that undergird various religious traditions and worldviews. I've been committed to the idea that my own place in the classroom and the institutions in which I have taught has been one of trying to help students unlock their own presuppositions and value claims in order to examine those value claims' coherence, validity, entailments, and application. 
In short, I've seen myself as trying to help students learn how to think rather than what to think. In retrospect, though, it occurs to me that the big questions, the human questions, can engage students in a type of self-exploration that somehow allows them to move across the fragile landscape between what scholars think of when they juxtapose religious studies and theology. And yet, it's in the very space of addressing big questions that issues of religious studies and theology perhaps become the most pertinent, especially in an area where more and more people, or excuse me, an era, where more and more people are moving away from strict affiliation with a particular institutionally inflected religious identity. To what extent does thinking theologically mean thinking from within the normative claims of a particular institutionally religious category? Might it be better to address big questions in a religious studies classroom in a way that's not explicitly theological, lest those who do not identify with a particular tradition feel left out of the conversation, as if their concerns are somehow invalidated by their lack of membership in a particular group? These questions boil down to what we mean exactly when we use the word theology. If, when people speak of theology, they're thinking of theological talk as being aimed at persons who feel that they have a clearly delineated theological home, then it becomes unclear whether theological talk is meant to be inclusive or exclusive. And in light of the fact that an increasing number of students seems to feel that they do not have a theological home, if it is the case that big questions can only be addressed theologically, then a lot of people are going to feel excluded from vital conversations. Surely, making students feel excluded from questions of meaning cannot be the goal of higher education. Nor, it seems to me, can it be the proper goal of theology. If students who are in between identities understand, rightly or wrongly, theology to be something that excludes them, such perceptions would seem to obviate theology's healing potential by shutting people down and making them feel that they perhaps have no place in the classroom except one of self-protective detachment. So, um, and there are about 23 more pages that you can read soon in the book picture. Uh, but, um, so I wanted to read that to you, essentially to set the stage um, for what I walked into. Um, I have noticed over the years, and Linda Mercadante's um, Beyond Borders, uh, I can't remember the rest of the title. Uh, I've got it from somewhere else. Um, but she talked a lot about the idea of whether or not those who are sort of in between or those who self-identify as spiritual but not religious aren't really still asking theologically inflected questions, but they don't necessarily have the language um, to think of them as such or that the word theology itself has such a um, hermeneutically problematic place in terms of their conceptualizations of what that even means. Um, in other words, uh, people are still interested in these questions even if, um, if they don't seem to have a sort of a clear theological stance. Okay. Um, let me shift gears just a little bit. Um, one of the biggest challenges, I think, when you're constructing a syllabus is to try to figure out to whom you are pitching the course. <laughs> um, so both, both of my jobs have been in um, undergraduate liberal arts institutions in the South. We can talk more about that. I come with all sorts of um, interesting positionalities, as you can imagine. Um, but many of the introductory level courses that I've taught have been open to everyone from um, first year interim students for whom this is the only acquaintance with religion that they will ever have, and this is a general education requirement. So you think, what do I want somebody to walk out here and be able to do? Everything from that student to the senior religion major who still needs to get one more elective major, uh, elective course done, and is in there for other types of reasons. So, um, in and of itself, that's a that's a pretty uh, a pretty difficult wide range of uh, of people to pitch to. And so, the question of, of what <laughs> why am I doing this? What am I trying to teach people? Um, 
what is it that I want them to take? Is it a certain methodological stance? Is it a certain way of approaching critical thinking through the lens of religious studies? Yeah, primarily that. Is it also to try to give them a sense of the lexicon of religious studies in case they go wrong with things? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So th these have been, again, the types of questions that I have asked over the years. And this, this move towards sort of interfaith studies, even though I wasn't really calling it that at the time, my dissertation itself is comparative in nature. Um, comparative philosophy of religions. This, these have been the kinds of questions I've been interested in all my life. Um, and, and again, though, this, this made them much more pressing and different. So I was trying to learn about Islam while I was trying to teach and figure out how much undoing um, of what they learn in the media do I need to do? And where does the line stop between the undoing of the media narrative and becoming an apologist for a tradition? Um, just all, all sorts of things there. So, um, I was at Transylvania University for four years. Um, the following year, I took a job at Walker College, a small liberal arts college in the South, um, actually in my hometown, which was also an interesting thing to walk back into. Um, but Walford is a is a, a wonderful place, and I, I will tell you, it is with no exaggeration or effort at um, false feel goodness or something like that. It's such a privilege to work with young people in that phase of their lives where they're figuring out who they are um, and, and what they want to do and become. Um, you know, some days, it's, of, of course, most you want to bang your head against the table, but most days, it's just it's just fantastic. It's, it's really an honor. Um, okay, so after I got to Wofford, um, a colleague there had heard that I had worked with the Wabash Center for Teaching and Learning and Theology and Religion. Nice short title there. Um, on a study about teaching introductory courses, teaching introductory religion courses. Um, and she asked me if I wanted to be part of another grant. Um, so the Teagle Foundation, and any of these things you're curious about, I'm happy to tell you more about, but had put out a call for um, proposals um, that it sounded fancier than this, but this is how I interpreted it. It was basically, here we are sort of on the heels of this big assessment movement in higher education. And now it's time to ask the so what question. We've got all this data, but what do we do with it? <laughs> Can we actually use it to try to improve teaching and learning? Um, and and how, do we, how do we do that? Does anybody really care about the data? Um, so our grant um, that I, I helped with, and this is another one of these <laughs> delightfully cumbersome files that just rolls right off the tongue. Um, ours was using assessment evidence to improve programs and promote shared responsibility for mission-based outcomes. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's a great title. But that's that's essentially what it what it focused on was um, trying to take a look at Walker's mission and think about the degree to which it the way we're doing things now um, was inflected through or by 21st century challenges. Were the, were the ways that we were interpreting what our mission as an institution was, were they matching up with where we were in the world and what we needed to be doing? So it was kind of a two-pronged grant. Part of it, um, the part that I didn't deal with as much, um, dealt with how to take a lot of the data that we already had and package it in ways that were um, um, easily interpretable and interesting to faculty members, trying to figure out what they would care about and how to, how to get that to them in ways that would be useful. The part that I was involved with um, dealt with something that I had noticed over the years. Um, it had seemed to me that there had been big pushes for diversity um, in education um, over the last 10, 20 years, as well as should be. And the term diversity, many, many curricula had diversity requirements, and that type of thing you would have to take one from a many courses to satisfy that requirement. Um, and generally, the word diversity would map onto race, class, and gender. Again, as well as it should. Um, but then I started asking questions about, like, what about religious diversity? And, and all of your good, diehard um, 
diversity is great, people were like, oh, oh, sister, back off. <laughs> yeah, they got really, you know, really squirrely about that. Like, oh, we don't do that. Um, so that, that's part of, of what led here, was to think about what types of ethical obligations um, do we have toward our students to try to give them the tools to learn to engage difference productively, including religious difference, especially religious difference. Um, so what, what were we doing at Walker? So this, this grant allowed us to, to focus on that, and it was through the money from this grant that we got involved with the Innovate Youth Corps. Um, which I'm happy to talk more about and is just an incredible organization and wonderful to work with. Um, but one of the things that we did with them through this grant was that we got involved with, I think what they call it, a deep engagement. It's about a two or three year commitment with them. And they came to campus, they sent consultants to campus um, and helped us do asset mapping, sort of just looking at the landscape that we already had. Um, there were surveys, there were focus groups with faculty, staff, and students. Uh, there was all sorts of, it was, it was really great. And the other thing that was really nice was we had a call with them every week, so it kept us honest. You know, we had to, we couldn't let it fall through the cracks because we had to sort of report it with them every week. This grant was shared with Elon University. The stipulations of the grant were that you had to pair up with another school. So that was really, really great too, to be able to compare um, between the two schools and the two institutional contexts, how we did things. Um, and it was out of this grant work of Elon that the rubric that you have, I think, in front of you was born. Let me tell you a little bit about that. So, um, and I, I am not a huge fan of higher ed jargon, even though I use it all the time. At this point, probably the word rubric would have made me break out the rash, but um, I love it now. Um, okay. So this this was one of two um, summer retreats that we, we used the grant money for. This is one of the best things to do, is get everybody off of their own campuses and sort of away from their email and out of their heads. And we went to this beautiful place in North Carolina called the Highland Park Inn. Um, it has a big sign that says, Be Her Bears, which is a little disconcerting. <laughs> um, but it was really great to be in a different place just focusing on this. We had you know, plenty of food, plenty of, of drink, all sorts of stuff. So we really, our energy was just focused on this. And one of the things that my colleague, um, Peter Felton, who is this guy right here, you can tell I'm being shoved at the front. <laughs> um, suggested that we bring in this woman, Ashley Finley, from AACAU. The Association of American Colleges and Universities um, is, a, is a group that works with a lot of these types of questions we've been talking about. And they have recently been involved with a project, I think it started in 2007, um, called the Value Rubrics. VALUE stands for Valid Assessment of Learning in Undergraduate Education. Um, and to me, if, if these things are great. I, I hope this link will work. If not, I can show you some of these after class. After class? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, after lunch. Um, I, my sense of what these, these rubrics are aimed at is how do you, uh, if you're in an atmosphere where you've got to assess stuff, and we are. And I think that, that's both good and bad for all sorts of reasons. Um, but how do, you, how do you assess the unassessable? How do you evaluate? If part of your mission is to try to work with your students' ethical development, a lot of that, you're not going to be able to tell them anything until you're about to get freshman. But how do you even begin to measure that? How do you even begin to think about how that goal translates into the nuts and bolts of the classroom? Um, intercultural competency is another one. What does that even mean? Um, it's great. What does that mean? Does it mean she knows some languages? Yeah. yeah. So that's what these values and rubrics focus on. Critical thinking, intercultural competency, ethical development, that type of thing. Let me see if I can get, get this link to work. Cannot locate it. Oh, because my internet is not. I'll show them to you later. Anyway, they're, they're pretty interesting. We used those value rubrics and the way that they were set up as the template for this. 
This is essentially, it looks almost identical to one of the value groups, but it's focused on um, religious pluralism, which, and I'm sure all of you probably know this, and, and I'm working off of Diana X, and he tells discussions of pluralism, but there are senses in which religious pluralism is the word used to talk about what we mean by diversity, but diversity doesn't mean from the So, same sort of desires for diversification, for intercultural competency, but usually when we're talking about religion, we talk about, about pluralism. Um, and that is a fraught term. It, is, it will be no surprise to you. The language in this is, you know, that's always a challenge. Um, does the idea about interfaith engagement leave people of, of both faith out of the conversation? That's another huge, huge challenge. Does it leave people who are in between, as I was talking about in, um, in this paper, in between identities or a hybrid religious identities, where do they fit into this conversation? So, but that, that's where this, this rubric was, was born, um, was out of that grant and working with, um, with a, someone from AIDS and you knew. And she said, you know, she hadn't, she said, I was trained in sociology and I, she said, I will admit to you, I never even really thought about religion as being an important thing to think about in terms of a lot of these broader goals of, of higher education. Um, so that was, was interesting to sort of have her along for the ride as well. Um, and I'm happy to talk about specifics on here. We spent a lot of time defining our terms, um, trying to use this as just a template with which people can do other kinds of stuff. But trying to figure out this first um, vertical column of what in the world were the ingredients that make up this cake <laughs> of pluralism and worldview engagement. Um, it, that took a while. Um, but we we thought in terms of knowledge of one's own worldview, are you even aware of the fact that you have one? And can you articulate what it is? Um, knowledge of other worldviews, attitudes toward pluralism, interpersonal engagement, and interfaith action and reflection. One of the, of the biggest challenges that we dealt with is we sat around tables much like we are right now. Um, people who worked in administrative roles, people who were faculty, etc., was trying to think about are we trying to are we trying to train people for civic engagement? Are we trying to train good citizens? Are we trying to train people for religious literacy? Or are we trying to train activists? Um, and we finally it kind of realized that our, our friends from Interfaith Youth Corps really wanted to make it, make activists were trying to help us create change agents. And there were a lot of the religious studies faculty who were like, that's not what I do. I mean, that's great, but that, that's not really what my job is in the classroom. So that was interesting to negotiate. And, and when we talked about this in other settings, we presented on this on the group. Um, one of the primary things that has come up is people's, uh, even though they don't say it quite like this, but it revolves around the fact that, that by the very fact that this group of are making a normative claim that pluralism is a good and that engaging with difference productively is a good. And in fact, we are. Um, so we can make whatever you want to out of that. Um, then we can talk about the benchmark, milestone, capstone kind of thing too. Um, but to scooch along, so that was one grant. If you ever start to dip your toe into the grant world, um, you know that one will lead to another, which can be great, <laughs> but it will take a lot of to make sure it's something you're really passionate about. Uh, which this is this has been. I mean, this has been fantastic work. So this this Teagle grant. Um, one of the things that sort of led the way into was the invitation to apply for another grant affiliated with um, AAC and you, but a sort of a partner project called Bringing Theory to Practice, which is sort of what it sounds like. We've got all these great theories. What does it actually mean in practice? Um, and they focused, the, the phase of this project that we were in was focusing on, on human flourishing, sort of whole student development. Um, psychological well-being, um, and again, questions of what what role does that play on a college campus? What 
part do we play in developing whole people, not just kind of trying to force some facts into their heads and stuff. Um, so again, a two-pronged grant. Two of my colleagues were working sort of with more nuts and bolts stuff about sophomore advising, because that sophomore year is often when people kind of fall into a hole. Um, and my colleague, Ron Robinson, and I were working more with, with this rubric and saying, okay, we've got this rubric now. What would be, to use some of the higher ed jargon, best practices associated with this rubric? How might we teach a course or a series of courses that could actually try to, to you know, put this into play, where this would be relevant? Um, so that was that was what we did with our part of the of the grant money. I attended some conferences and all sorts of stuff. Um, but that it was out of this that syllabus you saw that we'll look at in just a second was born. Um, one of the things I attended was um, a summer session that I think we'll probably keep going. So. And you become faculty members, I hope it's still going. A co sponsored summer session with the Council of Independent Colleges and IFYC that's about interfaith studies, sort of focusing on how to, what does it even mean? Um, what it teaches in the classroom? How do you do it? What are some, some syllabi construction tips and that kind of thing? One of the things that we really, really wanted to, to do in this course. Um, and the, one of the primary things that we used the, our part of the grant money for um, was this. We wanted to not only talk about interfaith engagement and pluralism in the classroom in a theoretical way, but we also wanted to try to do it, which is really hard. Um, especially if you've only got a limited amount of time to do it, because you don't want to do this sort of kind of like a drive-by service, you know, in the, the service learning world, the idea that you could go to a student pension for two days and then you're good, you got it all down. That, that wasn't the type of thing that we were trying to, to accomplish. Oh, okay. 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 Um, so, my first thought was that we could go to Atlanta because it was close by. There were some really interesting places we would be able to go to there. And my colleague, Ron, said, How are we going to wash to do, like, and I thought that's brilliant and really expensive, which, which it, it was, but um, it, it, but it was a, it was a game changer, I think. Um, one of the things that I had a distinction I had that seems so obvious now, but that I had not been able to make in my own mind that came out in the summer interfaith engagement seminar um, that I just mentioned. When I was talking to Edu Patel about a lot of the arguments he makes for why interfaith engagement is good and why they do it. And many of his um, arguments revolve around the civic space, about creating a civic space. Um, and I said, but you know, <laughs> many of my students have very, very deep theological commitments, and they are, are even though they don't call it that, I think religious commitments, many of them are evangelical and have been taught that the very notion of engaging with difference is somehow, it's like a zero sum game that's taken away from their own religious self. Somehow that they're betraying their own identity by engaging in a positive way with others. And that is a, a real and deep struggle for a lot of, of our students. Um, and he said, you know, in terms of what I'm doing at IFYC, he said, I have never won an argument for pluralism on theological grounds. He said, that's just not, it, it, it's, it's a very difficult word to go down. But I thought that that was something we needed to at least address a little bit in class, because that's where our students were. I think that they felt like, absolutely, this is a civic good. Um, how do I say myself, how do I say the person that, where my grandpa want me to be and have taught me to be and go completely against the things that they've told me are true. So the syllabus is divided into the idea of pluralism as it, in the civic sphere and then sort of theologies of religious pluralism as well. The trip was positioned right in the middle of, we tried to, right in the middle of those two sections. So the course started in February and we did some reading and some reading and stuff. And then we went to, to Washington. Um, 
And Aaron, I'm about to show a picture of you. Um, here is our class. Um, we were able to, and, and I'm going to go through and show you some, some slides that are horrible and if I was grading myself, I'd give myself a D because it's a lot of tiny text. But this is my way of just remembering what I did. But one of the places we went to was, was the State Department. Um, uh, so I'm going to go through the list of people with whom we visited first. And this is the tiny text, and I'm sorry, I don't expect you to be able to read this. The first person was um, Michael Kessler um, at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs at Georgetown University. He was a classmate of mine here, um, which is really useful. <laughs> a lot of your friends here are going to be doing great stuff, and these will be great contacts for later on, but I just sent him an email and said, can we come and hang out with you? And what exactly is it that you do? Because I read the website and I didn't really understand it, which I think was instructive for him. I said, I'm having a hard time explaining to my students what it is exactly that you do. And so that was the first um, place that we went, and it was great. He was a, a wonderful, wonderful host. And he was my contact to get me in touch with Sean Casey at the State Department. Um, you all may know him. Um, he's the U.S. Special Representative for Religion and Global Affairs. Um, so we got to go to the State Department, which was super cool. We had to get clearance and everything, which, you know, for me, I was just like, this is, this is a big deal. Uh, then we went to see, uh, this may be out of order, but we went to the Public Religion Research Institute um, and talked to them about how they do a lot of their studies. Um, and our students were so impressive in terms of the ways that they asked about how they interpret data and how they present their data and everything. It was like, you could tell he was surprised by the question. That's right. <laughs> Uh, also at PRI was uh, Joanne Piacenza. Um, we also, and this this was just was such an honor. We uh, went to see Saeed Saeed, uh, who is the national director of the Islamic Society of North America's Office of Interfaith and Community Alliances uh, in DC. And one of the just neatest human beings I think I've ever been around. You know, there's certain people you are in their presence and you just think, I just, can I just sit in the same room with you and sort of absorb some of whatever it is you've got? Mm -hmm. um, so he, he, I don't get to do him justice here, but he's, he's done a lot of stuff. He worked with MSA, uh, Muslim Student Associations, in their early years. Um, we sat and had a very hurried lunch with him. And then, here's the crazy part, he walked us across the street to the Capitol building where he accompanied, accompanied us for Friday prayers, um, Muslim prayers in the Capitol, um, which was just incredible. Um, and we had read about the beginnings of, of that, how that came to be a thing at the Capitol in one of the details books, um, that actually Newt Gingrich had helped facilitate the early days of, of Muslim prayer in the capital, et cetera, et cetera. And then, then we actually went and did it. And that was that was phenomenal. Uh, then we had a day to run around and, and do stuff in the city, which was also great. And I had pictures from that that I almost put in, but I thought I would spare you that. <laughs> I never know later on. But, um, <laughs> yeah, we just put it on our and stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and one of the things that, that will endear me to Erin Simmons forever was how excited she was to go to the archive. <laughs> I was like, you are my people. Right? <laughs> That's your, your exciting thing. Um, and the last day, uh, we went to talk to the Reverend Gina Gillen Campbell at the National Cathedral. Um, and this was one of my colleague Ron's contacts. Um, she, the gist of it is that she had... Um, and I had missed this whole controversy. She had invited a group of Muslims to come and have Friday prayers at the National Cathedral. And as you can imagine, there was blowback. Um, and op-eds in the New York Times and all sorts of stuff that was deeply challenging for her, um, both as a human being and as a professional in her capacity to deal with. Um, but we went to a, a service at the National Cathedral, and then she took us upstairs in this room and gave us like an hour and a half of her time. And it was just 
And it was no BS at all. We, she just cut right in the It's sort of like, you know, it takes you a while to get into a really good part of the conversation. We just kind of poke right there. And it was, it was great. Um, it was really, really helpful. Uh, this I included just because I, I think it's hilarious. And I was, it was tired this morning. And we're outside the Capitol building, and for some reason, we're all tilting to one side. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, there's no rationale. Uh, and then this is us at the National Cathedral the next morning. So, so let's let's look at the syllabus, and then I will stop talking. Okay, so this is this is what we said we were going to do. We didn't have time to do all this. Um, we ended up doing some other stuff. When I first um, was asked to do this practice teaching seminar, I thought I'm going to talk about the introductory class that I did such a horrible job on the first year I taught and how I changed it and how it's better, rather than something that was so new. Um, I had not even fully process, but I'll read it in here that I, it, it worked. The class worked. I think a lot of it had to do with the, the chemistry of the students who were in there, um, which is going to make it really hard to teach it another time because we're not going to be able to replicate that exact same group. Um, but so in terms of, of the text, um, we had listed that we were going to do Francis Clooney's Comparative Theology, Deep Learning Across Religious Borders. Um, Diana X, part of Diana X, Encountering God, A Spiritual Journey from Bozeman to Benares, especially the chapter seven where she talks, she lays out the framework of inclusivism, exclusivism, and pluralism. Linda Mercadante's Belief Without Borders, Inside the Minds of the Spiritual and Not Religious. Excuse me, which unfortunately we had completely to bring that time, but I, I used it in, in class in other ways. Even Patel's Sacred Ground, Pluralism, Prejudice, and the Promise of America. Um, and then Chris Stedman's Faithiest, Common Atheist and Common Ground for Religious, which is a, a great, very teachable book. And we were able to have him step in class one day and talk to students and just surprise them. And everyone came and just sort of like mute and <laughs> um, So I, I don't want to read with you, but if you can sort of look at what the goals of the course are and the objectives of the course. If you'll turn to the, the section where we've got the tentative schedule of readings, um, <coughs> we started off by um, self indulgently uh, asking the class class to read some articles that have been written about some of the work that we've been doing with these grants. But also to just say, Here, here's why we think this is important, and here's we're thinking about Walford and the nature of our life here together, and the nature of education, and we want your feedback on this. Um, we were also, as part of the Green Theory Practice Grant, we framed the idea of um, human flourishing. It's one of its necessary ingredients being attention to religious and spiritual questions. However, that's implicit. But that's a necessary part of human flourishing because that's what the brain is interested in and help um, whole student development. So we try to be as just upfront with the students as we possibly can be about this is part of the grant, this is what we're looking at, these are our, these are our questions. Um, so, if you can see at the top, the civic grounds for religious pluralism, that's sort of how we organized the first part of the course. The second part of the course was about the theological and philosophical challenges of religious pluralism. One of the reasons that we end up leading more, and, and this has happened in every course I've ever taught. I, I had a general idea of how I think the schedule's going to go, but um, I think, for me anyway, it's good to... Uh, have a sense of, of what the deal breakers are. I mean, I can't cut this. But the other thing is that if, if we need more time to talk about something else, let the other stuff go. I am a, a big believer in, in less is more. I would rather read a few things in depth than try to cover a huge swath of content. Um, and that, that's, that's just me. But um, 
one of the things that happened while this course was in progress was the, um, the shooting of three students at, in Chapel Hill, three Muslim students in Chapel Hill. Um, and we're, we're very close to there. We have people on our campus who knew those students. Um, at the same time, there was a controversy at Duke University about um, Muslim prayers occurring in the chapel. Um, there had also been some sort of behind the scenes controversy about stuff we were doing at Walker that we didn't <laughs> share with the students, and I probably shouldn't be mentioned. But, um, but so we took, we took the day, um, and my colleague Ron compiled a great number of things. Oh, and also with Forrest had been getting challenged by several groups that disagreed with the pluralistic stance that he took. So he put together a set of documents, and we spent some time just processing that and thinking about the part of the world that we live in um, and just sort of what was going on. Um, and I think that and the trip to Washington where students were able to see that uh, not only that studying about religion matters deeply, um, but that also they, they can do stuff it helped them conceptualize the world of work. Um, I think one of the things that, that is challenging and frightening for students and for parents, and one of the things that is leading to this whole sort of hysteria about the death of the humanities in higher education, um, you know, everybody aware of this, um, uh, is I think much of this is sort of seeded by parallel conversation that talks about the fact that the economy is changing so fast, you will not be in the same job. The job that you'll have hasn't even been created yet. We don't know what the world is going to look like. Which, for an undergraduate student, I'm sure it's like, well, great. You know, thanks. What am I supposed to do? So I think one of the things that was helpful when we went to D.C. was to help them see different facets of, of ways of doing things that matter in terms of public policy. Um, that through which religion was inflected, but you know, uh, other ways that their courses matter. Um, it's easy, I think, for students to think that there's a sort of one to one correspondence with whatever they major in and what their job is going to be. Which is really problematic. <coughs> um, so that's, that's one of the things that we did that bumped the perfect Monday off the syllabus. And another thing we did was something that my colleague suggested called scriptural reasoning. Um, some of you may, may know something about this. Um, it is a, a thing that has existed for a while, and for some reason the guy's name came up with it. Peter Peter Ox, thank you. Um, we can talk more about that, and I can give you resources. But essentially, you take, um, sometimes once you've been with the group long enough, you take a text from your own tradition that is troubling to you. And with the group with whom you've already built up a certain level of, of trust, um, talk about that text with them. Um, but what we what we did on a particular day of class was we asked some people that we knew from the community, um, from within different religious traditions, to come in, um, and they all looked at a text together. I can't even remember the text. I think they dealt with compassion, perhaps, or something along those lines. Each had that. They each had texts. It was like they took a, it was a theme, and they each pull a text from their own tradition mm -hmm. and they compare it. Or they all discussed it together. That's, that's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. I didn't read some class here yet. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that, that was it. And, and it, again, just, just watching people do this together, they, they sat uh, in sort of a, a square of desks in the middle of the room, and we sat in tables around it. And then, you know, everyone acknowledging how kind of weird and artificial this was. But, um, but we just, they basically let us watch them have a conversation. Um, and it was, it was great. It was really, really fantastic. So I guess the, the more sort of meta point I would make is in terms of constructing your syllabus. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not in my classes trying to teach people material they're going to need to know for the NCAP. So I know that I, I have a certain amount of flexibility in terms of if I change my mind about what I want to do. I try not to change the dates of when tests are going to occur, or if I do, to make it in the future, yeah, to make it, to make it later. 
But in, in other terms, if an opportunity comes along or if something happens in the world, um, I remember when I was in my first year here, the whole debacle with Waco happened. Um, and several people that I knew from other facets of my life said, well, y'all must really be talking about this a lot at the new school. I said, I need to come up. Nobody even mentioned it. Um, I, I think the Div School today is, is different. I think that it would. Um, but that room to actually sort of look at, <laughs> oh my God, um, <laughs> your faces. Um, the room to, to address things that are actually happening, but also to, and this is scary, to be able to go in the classroom and say, I don't even entirely understand this yet myself. Here's what I think is going on, but, but I don't know. What do you, what do you think? Um, Letting go of that a little bit, the sort of stage on stage thing, um, it can be pretty terrifying if you don't know what's going to happen. Um, and when it doesn't go well, it's it's just it's horrible. <laughs> but when it works, and it usually works, there's no better feeling in the world. The last thing that I want to mention, I promised you I would stop talking, I really will. One of the thousands of things that I've sent to the indulgent error um, in the active materials was a link to um, Prof. Milan's 2011 presidential address uh, at the American Academy of Religion. And I heard her, I almost didn't get it, and I went and heard it, and it just, oh, it was fantastic. Um, she sort of, she gives the history of the study of religions as other in just a beautiful, clear way. But I had also, I think two or three years before, um, I often go to the to teaching about religion panels at AAR. And there was one that where Amy Tate, I think this president this year, we talked about this one. Um, she had done a, a survey, if I remember correctly, of what job would be there have been there in the last five to ten years. And was just essentially charting how things could change and what kind of demand there was and posing the question of ethically, are we training PhD students for what they're going to need to actually do. I think that this craft of teaching seminar is absolutely in the right direction. Um, but it was, it was sobering. Um, and so that uh, session that I had gone to and, then, and hearing this part of her address is something that I wanted, wanted to mention to you. So in, in this part, this is towards the end of her, of her talk, you know, her essay, which um, where she's talking about sort of the state of things now and how the AAR is constructed and how the types of sections the AAR had have changed over the years. And that type of thing. She says, finally, the economy and job prospects will push us to reimagine our field and the AAR. I was very struck by the title of Donald Lopez Jr.'s book, Curators of the Buddha, which came out in 1995. How do we characterize what we're doing? Are we curators of the Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, Aphrodite, and Kali, or whoever the great religious speakers are that we happen to study? Curating implies collecting, studying, classifying, and displaying. These are meticulous tasks and worth doing. But the world does not need many curators. Many of our graduate students cannot find jobs. What our world desperately needs are communicators. People who have a deep knowledge of the subject and can speak to the lawyers, doctors, social policy makers, government officials, and ordinary people on the street about why religion matters. In the name of God and religion, racism, bigotry, violence, and colonialism have been perpetrated. Yet religion has also inspired people to fight for justice, search for the common good, save the environment, and seek out for the 99%. Our graduates should be equipped not only to teach religion and theology, but also to seek careers in government, business, journalism, and nonprofit organizations. To train people that the society has a demand for means that we have to rethink reimagine and recreate our discipline and certification process. So, <laughs> pressing it, I think, with this fact of teaching so much. I, y'all have been very indulgent, and I, 
added some of my voice. So I am going to ask if there are any questions. Maybe look to Aaron and see if there's something super important that I didn't mention. Okay. <laughs> well, we have over a half an hour for discussion. Let's get some things up. Um, one question about the, the part where you uh, talking about bringing theory to practice. Um, and part of that, I mean, we do certainly practice teaching and some other workshops too. Yeah. Uh, and one of them, we have created uh, some kind of styles, and one of them is actually called Why Does It Matter? Um, and I guess one of, one of my questions is how do you make a transition from this level of discussion grad school to Chicago? where people are very invested in very specific topics that you were saying or to actually, uh, I don't know, uh, convince people that there is also a very important part of this that should be connected to why the thing actually matters beyond here. Uh, and I guess one way to do it is just try to convince people and make the case and stuff like that. But I was, I was wondering if there's some kind of structural changes that can be made. I'm just thinking, for instance, like people really are eager to present stuff in the workshop because they actually want to practice for AR or something like that, mm -hmm. or the system normally asks for a conventional paper and addressing more conventional topics all the time with some, whereas there's no, so much room for thinking, yeah, how do we explain these things beyond academia right. to people interested in them by different categories, mm -hmm. different languages, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is for recommendations, some structural, some practical, you know. Um. One thing I had learned to do, um, which would come as a surprise to you after I've been talking to you for an hour and a half, uh, but I had to learn to shut up. Um, in terms of trying to figure out how I could translate what we were doing into the lives of students and help them see why this mattered, I had to listen to them a lot. And so um, there's a, a book that I think is, is really interesting by Barbara Walbord called Teaching Introductory Courses in Theology and Religion. I'm really bad at remembering titles. Um, but it's, it, some of the chapters are included with the materials that I sent. So the first, the first chapter of this book, and I promise I'm wandering my way back to your question, she talks about, in, in the studies that she did, what she ended up calling the Great Divide. Um, between students' expectations and desires for what they wanted out of a religious studies class and the professor's expectations and desires, or at least the ones that they articulated on the page. Students wanted to examine their own lives and their own ethical systems and you know, that kind of thing. And professors generally were like, mm, no, we're trying to improve critical thinking. Um, so the trick is to figure out a way how to show students that critical thinking skills do apply to those parts of their lives as well. That the two aren't necessarily divorced from one another. So, so how do you do that? One thing that, that Lawler talks about is she said that uh, a lot of the teachers that she talked with had what she calls sub-rosa goals. Um, that and, and not as a, as a matter of subterfuge, but more just sort of knowing what's what's going to be happening when you read certain types of texts to you. Uh, so while you might not articulate as one of the goals of the course on the syllabus, I want you to, to think about or something about your own life. Um, you might say something like, one of the goals of this class is to teach you to foreground and become aware of the value plans that you have and to evaluate whether or not they're coherent, to try to evaluate where they came from. If you think a certain thing, why do you think you think that? Where did you learn it? And then you can start to talk about you know, how society works and how any broader types of things. And, you're, and so then you can say, and that's what the theorist is talking about. Um, so finding, one of the things that I typically do is I find low stakes writing assignments, often within class time itself, where I'll take a passage and just say, what is that I'm talking about? And then we'll just go around and try to figure out what they're pulling out of it. Or, you know, I'll, I'll get them to do, again, low stakes, informal writing about certain types of things. And try to figure out what they have found in the text that's interesting to them and what they found in the text that's not interesting to them. And, and figure out why it is. 
Um, the other thing that I think, and this, this took me a while, um, but so, okay. One <laughs> of the texts that I probably misguidedly used in one of my classes called Religious Pilgrimage is um, Eliada's um, The Myth of the Eternal Return, which is not one of his easier texts, and it's showing straightforward. I mean, you know, he wanders all over the place. But it's really, really interesting, and it sets up the rest of the course really well. But it's for, again, for, for a lot of times, first year college students trying to read this thing, and they real, are not yet to the point where they can read something that's hard to understand and not assume that it's because they're stupid, not realize that it has something to do with the way that it's written. Um, at one point, when we're in the text, I, I would do things like ask them what the assignments for that text is. Write me a short paper answering the question of when you feel like you're the most yourself. No right or wrong answers, just you know, complete sentences and that kind of thing. If you can't figure that out, try to think about times when you feel like you're not yourself. What those contexts are and why in the situations you feel like you're not yourself. And they're kind of like, okay. Um, and they bring those in and we start to see common themes about when they feel like they're themselves, when they feel like they're not themselves. And I say, this is what Eliade means by cosmos. And this need to do the thing that you wrote about here is what he means by blah, blah, blah. So sometimes, and, and these are just things that I've kind of come up with over the years. And, and it's often when a class has not gone well. And I'm thinking, I, I don't know what to do here. But trying to figure out what the meta point is, the author is trying to get at, and then trying to do a writing assignment that's more relevant to them and say, that's what this is. Um, that, that's kind of how I try to do it. Rather than saying, wake up, this really, really matters. Um, kind of sneak it in them. I have a little follow-up. Um, I was just wondering, I think I agree very much, but um, how do we foster that kind of interest and way of thinking here when we don't have so much exposure to students in that level yet? Uh, is there something that you recommend uh, beforehand? Uh, I mean, just, you know, this will happen either like later on. There's some exposure at some point, but not a lot. So I was wondering uh, if there is a way or you can anticipate some of these moves before you actually are teaching or build. Maybe not. Well, I think that the answer is that Practical engagement of our work with these kind of questions. 
from now instead of just then, uh, in a way that is organically connected to our research. So how do you encourage that now in a way that is not, oh, when you get there, you need to think, uh, you know, six months before teaching how to do it, whereas uh -huh. from here you kind of start preparing a kind of organic connection between the more theoretical and the more practical mm -hmm. in terms of why does it matter? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And I mean, and I'm wondering if some of what you're asking is, should I think about what I end up writing about for however many years in terms of how it's going to fold into my teaching? Or, you know, um, so, and keep pressing me on this because I feel like I'm kind of dancing around your question but not really, really getting to it. Um, one thing I have found is that sometimes it's easier, at least early on, to, when you teach about things you don't know as much about. Uh, because, and I think this is relevant to what you're trying to ask, when I wanted to teach my research, and it was a tiny little corner of my students' religious traditions class, because I had to think about, okay, why do I even want to share this with them? Why should they care? Um, well, this is actually why I wrote it. You know, not the reasons that I necessarily said in my dissertation colloquium, but really the reasons that led me to this question. I was wondering about the nature of the soul. That was it. Um, so, how do I need to get them there? Um, the other, the other thing that I think, again, it's so self-evident that we often don't do is when you're planning a course, begin by thinking about what it is you're trying to do. Do you want them to know the basics of the origin story of Islam, for example? Do you want them to be able to pick up a newspaper and understand that when groups have different names that they tag onto a historical narrative and therefore have relevance in a particular way? Do you, you know, again, think through some of the many things that you want them to be able to do when they leave, and then figure out if, if some of the stuff you're having them read doesn't map onto one of those, why are you doing it? Um, so, you know, in terms of what you're researching now, I don't know if I would be as, as led by, am I going to be able to teach well on this? I think I'd be led by, how is this teaching going to be a good thinker? Write about something that you love and that you're, you're going to be able to sustain. Because it's that method of being an inquirer that you are going to need to model for your students. Whether you teach them the specifics of your dissertation, maybe not. Um, but you are going to, have a deeper awareness of what it means to swim around in the unknown. And so try to take yourself back to your 18, 19 year old self and think about what does it mean to be approaching this? What are some of the basics? The first time I taught an Asian religion class, it was horrible. I remember this so vividly. I was teaching about Buddhism and I had been training so well here that I could think, we talked about this last night, I could think of every statement that I made. I could think of the counter argument, and the counter argument, the counter argument, and the counter claim, and the counter claim. So it's like I could hardly add a sentence where before I would say, well, so there are these texts that were, well, hang on a second. First of all, you need to know that, well, wait, let me back up a little bit more and you know, tell them all these things. And finally, after I was talking about the Mahayana Buddhist corpus for probably two days worth of a class, I still remember where he was sitting. There was a young man right over here, and he just kind of, Gravely raised his hand and he said, So, when you talk about the texts, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I said, I'm just so sorry. <laughs> and I realized, you know, I, I wanted to, I, I was so ambitious, I wanted to teach them to, you know, deconstruct things and see how things were culturally constructed. And, and it hadn't really occurred to me that before you can give people the tools to deconstruct, you have to give them the constructed thing. You have to show them what the, what the thing is that you're trying to take apart. And I, I had not done a good, a good job of that. So that, I think, would be maybe the most solid advice I could give you. If you know that you want them to understand this one thing, think, okay, what are the backward steps when you design backward and figure out how to get them there? So the need to go on to kind of so I just want to uh, no, no, <laughs> just mention that so it's not uh, yeah. so something that you want to shoot that, right? Storm out and slam the door. I think it's interesting, you know, I think it's an interesting flip side to Ellen's question, which is already part of 
um, some of the thinking we're doing in the program, which is, on one hand, we're, we're all thrust into projects that are so consuming that we need to be thinking something about what they offer to our teaching agendas and teaching attendance. But at the same time, to be thinking about the ways that we learn, not only our own material, but all the range of things that we don't know about. We'll be in positions of teaching. How are we learning with educational objectives in mind? Yeah. Even before we pass the book, before we know anything about it. So yeah, that, that moment of sort of metacognition. And, and then too, our, articulating that to your students, you know, taking some time in class to say, how, how do you learn? How do you learn? What do you feel like are your strengths and weaknesses as a writer? What do you want to what do you want to work on? If you read this and you didn't understand it, tell me where you stopped understanding it in the text. You know, if you were on the bus up to this point, let's figure out what happened. Um, and yeah, that that's that's really hard. I that summer, I had to do my kind of crash course in Islam. Um, it was so hard. And I felt like, you know, I'm here I'm sort of like an expert now. I've got my, my driver's license to, to be a professor now. And I was overwhelmed. And that was one of the best things that could have happened to me because it showed me the students were going to feel like. And so how did you do that? Right? How, how did you yeah. go about that? Well, one thing, I mean, so one thing I noticed that, well, they had a ton of readings to give to us. The books that bored the absolute crap out of me, I had to figure out why does that bore me so much? Because they're good books that I just, I, I zoned out. I thought I probably shouldn't teach those because I'm not going to teach them very well. Um, but the other thing was I noticed when I was trying to learn about Islam, when I would come across um, an Arabic word, I found even in my reading, I would sort of skim over it because um, it was just like, blah, blah, blah. And then I'd read the rest of the sentence, and then blah, blah, blah. And it was very hard for me to find a footing until we had had some of our sessions. And what are like the six terms that I need to know that are really important, the, the fundamental building blocks to understand the rest of the stuff? Once I figured those out, I was able to do it. So in my classes now, like in the Buddhism class, I say, OK, you are going to encounter a lot of terminology that's transliterated Sanskrit that is going to be terrifying to you. Don't worry about it. And that, I think, is important to lower their anxieties because you know, it's hard to learn when you're going on. Um, and I say, I am going to give you a list of the terms that I want you to know. There's going to be no guesswork about it. I'm going to give them to you on the test. I'm going to get you to define like 8 out of 10 to get to choose because you'll probably have a fear in headlights moment. Because here are the things that we need to do in order to do the cool stuff later. Because I because that's what I have to do. So, yeah. I have a question about, uh, you said that like uh, reading this kind of course or working for example in the fake new course uh, is normative, meaning that like you said, pure is good. Yeah. How do you, like how do you deal in class with the other approach to religious diversity, like violence or exclusion, especially if you have students that come from a religious background? That support that kind of answer, like this exclusion of state that they have that are wrong. How do you think that? Um, that's a great question. So I think um, <laughs> part of it is that, that we just name it up front. Um, say in class, you know, the very nature of of what we're doing is putting this forth as a normative plane. I mean, even just saying this is this, and that is an educational end in and of itself. Saying what we're doing is not value free. Um, and then talking about, okay, why might somebody argue against this? What might be counterpoints to this? And it's hard because you also, I think, you know, you have to be able to foster a certain atmosphere of trust within the classroom and among the students where they can actually talk about the things they're thinking about. Um, but I, so, so for example, once sometimes I'll think of theoreticals. And I'll say that I know aren't the radicals in the room. I'll say, let's say that um, I was raised in a, in a evangelical home, and I've been told A, B, C, and D, and then I come in and I'm told this, and I have someone I fall in love with who is a member of this tradition that I've been told is going to hell. What do I do? And you see people starting to. <laughs> 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 um, so eventually, again, just naming it, saying this. Here are some of the problems inherent in this, or maybe talking a little bit about the history of the study of religion 
and why it's been so foggy, <laughs> um, I think is, is helpful. Does that kind of yeah, yeah, no, I mean, sure. give a follow up? No, it's like, yeah, I mean, that's like the stating that is no unmade by and it is normal, it is like very important. For example, when, when you have to talk, it's like teach historically about religion and like you cannot ignore the value and the value of Yeah, I think, you know, when I'm thinking about it, well, well, one thing is that as long as you're sticking to the text, and part of what part of what you're doing, the, another meta goal of the class, is teaching people how to read closely and how to just interpret what in the world this person is talking about. Um, and that's that's hard in and of itself. But then you can really focus on what is it that this author is trying to say. What evidence do you have for your assumption that this is what she means? And in unpacking what her argument is, then a lot of times in the discussion, that other stuff can come out. But we'll say, okay, here's here's why she said she's writing this, and here's what she thinks. And then you can talk about counterclaims and that kind of thing. As long as you know, as long as you're talking about a text, you're not talking about yourself. You're, you're dealing with the ideas. You're playing with the ideas. So just kind of what you're supposed to do. All right, stay tuned. It's not. I mean, certain yet, but we're working on trying to put together a craft teaching session in the spring on precisely some of these issues. So we'll have, we'll have another opportunity to dig in. Look at you. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're trying to teach productive interfaith dialogue, how do you set the ground rules for the conversation? Given that often if people are talking, people of different faiths, they might not even know they're saying something offensive that is offensive. How do you? Prepare for that and set ground rules. Yeah, that's hard, um, <laughs> and it, it changes from from context to context. If you have a um, you know a class of 25 students in an intro level class, you're going to do one kind of thing. If you have an upper level seminar with 15 students, you might do it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. um, if you're doing it with your colleagues, that's a whole other ball of wax. Um, and much, much harder. Um, but again, a lot of it is to, to just to name it, to say, you know, in, in my syllabi, I have a section that talks about um, ground rules just for class discussion in the sense that we all have the, the right to be listened to and to and to listen and, and what class participation means if you're shy, you know, that always the people who talk the most aren't always the ones who are actually saying things and um, but then to, so one, to just name that and to say, look, what are we doing in this classroom? Why are we studying religion and what does that mean? And I try to begin by reassuring them that, that I am not, that I care about them, but I don't care what they think in a way. What I'm trying to get them to do is, is figure it out and then own it. And if they, if they pull out their value plans and realize they don't cohere, maybe it's time to reevaluate that. That's fine. So in the process of sort of talking about that, what it means to study religion in the classroom, you can kind of see people relax. But then you can also say, ask the class, what are some ground rules? What are you afraid of? If you come into this classroom with a knot in your stomach, uh, when you've been in, in discussions that haven't worked well, what's been the problem? Uh, what, what kind of... Um, Hermeneutic of trust, you know, you have to but what kind of hermeneutics of trust would you like to be afforded to you? And then how do you afford that to somebody else? And, and that's usually by trying to, to get students to articulate, that can usually be helpful. Um, I think in terms of some of what you read, read from the AAR keynote, um, and some of what I'm thinking about applying for very few jobs right now. Uh, when students come to you interested in grad school, <laughs> how do you advise them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I'll tell you what I did. Um, I was at the right now. Um, you know, a lot of it takes a lot of self reflection because you have to think about 
Are, are you trying to create many versions of yourself in the classroom? Um, all of those other kinds of, I, I think, uh, I'm trying not to have a potty mouth while the camera's rolling, but I think a lot of times, especially in religious studies classrooms, people are working out their own stuff um, in ways that they're not even aware of. Um, sometimes it has to do with their own religious stuff that they haven't fully unpacked yet. Um, and therefore have sort of disdain towards people who are religious, and that's problematic in the classroom. Um, but also, I think a lot of people have notions of what they have earned by virtue of getting their PhD at some place like Chicago, um, and they are taught, whether tacitly or forthrightly, that what matters, with like capital M, is your research and publication. Um, if, you know, when I was here, again, I told you that I, I was really interested in, in teaching, but it was one of those things that if I talked to anybody about it, it sort of felt furtive, like, you know, kids back behind the dumpster at school smoking cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, so, so I think for many people who end up at a particular school because they get a job, they're in the process of thinking, I'm not at our own institution like I thought that I would be. And all of these people are idiots. I mean, I'm in here with these these Bible thumping 18 year olds when I should be able to impart my. But there's a lot of self work that I think um, um, a lot of people need to do. <laughs> what your question was? What were you saying? When students want to go to grad school, how do you advise them? Where to start? Maybe. That's why I have some notes for myself. I wanted to. I mean, it varies from case to case, but actually, it, it, okay. There's so many articles, as you know, and I'm sure you've read these when you were deciding whether to do this yourself, about basically in the Chronicle and stuff saying, don't do it. You know, the market is terrible. You'll hate yourself. Um, you'll be in debt. <laughs> of course, all that's true. The trick, I think, is to... Be honest without being completely discouraging because there's some people that really, really can do it and would really, really be good at it. Um, so I, I, but I don't super, super encourage people to go to grad school. I mean, I, I don't have a mentality that um, we are going to show our validity by how many people we have going to do school. Um, we don't need this many people on our team or something like that. One thing that's tricky is in a school, with, if you are in an atmosphere where the validity of your department is based on the number of majors you have, that's that's kind of related but a different. Anyway. Um, so it, it depends on the student. And a lot of times we spend a lot of time in office hours talking about why they want to go, what they're interested in doing. Um, you know, do they want to teach? Do they want to go into ministry? And, and that kind of thing. You try to help them find find some places, and then sometimes to hook them up with other people who are already in grad school to talk about how <laughs> how is this really? How is this been? Um, I, I hope that oh, yeah. I hope that it helps. I think in the 15 years I've been teaching, I think I have suggested Chicago. I think to four people. Um, and I have taught a lot of students, but I, you know, <laughs> I mean, I knew that there are a lot of people that, that one, it would, it would suck the life out of it for them, but that also, it's nice to just chew up and spit them out. I don't think it's going to chew up and spit them out. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of pressure right now. <laughs> Do they maybe want to go into 
a school of foreign service? Do they maybe want to go get a master's in this thing and then work in public policy later? To try to help them understand all of the different types of programs um, that are out there, too. Sure. I just wanted to add to what you're saying. Um, like our trip to DC, not, obviously not every class would have had that opportunity, but I think for all the students that were in the class, it helped us see that there are other avenues. Even if you do your master's in religion, that you don't necessarily have to go on to a PhD. There are a lot of things you can do with religion besides being in academia. And that was honestly not something I really knew or thought about, but it is now something that I'm considering because of what we had learned in that class. So even if you don't have the opportunity to take a trip like that, being able to advise about like other options. Right. I think. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and so just through sort of knowing people, I, I, I know about joint programs that Harvard has between the Divinity School and other schools where they can kind of pull this stuff in. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, and to, to be fair, I think that several years ago, after 9-11, um, for example, this State Department office that we went to has not existed for very long. I think that, you know, for many years, our sort of ethos, um, at least at the government level, was, well, we have separation of church and state, so our so religion doesn't matter in public affairs. And if they do, then they're wrong. Um, I don't know if you if you all, you all were probably children when this all was going on, but there was a, um, a Times, New York Times, I think, op-ed piece called, Do You Know the Difference Between a Sunni and a Shiite? That um, this this was a real thing, and it was talking about how in the State Department, all these people making policy had so little religious literacy that they didn't even know that. Um, I had one time when I taught Islam, there were some people on our um, campus who worked with ROTC who had been in both um, Afghanistan and in Iraq, and they came in and talked to the class about their experiences. It was, it was very moving, but I said to them, how much training did you have before you were sent to change hearts and minds <laughs> about the hearts and minds of the people you were going to meet? And um, the guy said, do you want to see my training PowerPoint? Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, again, it was sort of like the kids moving behind the dumpster. But it, so I, I went and he showed me, and the number of slides, this is probably eight, nine years ago. Um, you know how many next slides he had about religion specifically before going at least to Iraq? Again, I don't know how many did up there. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit more about that sort of space where you're kind of the difference between creating activists and creating mm -hmm. citizens of the world? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I'm feeling very Chicago -y right now. But I think you may have to think about what you mean by activists. Um, if you're if you're trying to create people who are going to make certain types of changes, um, you have to think long and hard about what the mission of your institution is, and if that accords with it, and if that's if you're cool with that. Um, but but again, I would say being up front with sort of like pulling the curtain back and saying to students, why do you think you are required to take a religion course as part of our general education? And, and spending a whole day talking about that and telling them about the history of the, the diversity requirement and, you know, but then talking about the curriculum as a text that instantiates values, which are in our mission statement, and then saying, you know, sacred texts work like this too. Synergy. Um, <laughs> but, but again, to say, you know, some people have argued that it's to create good citizens and that being a good citizen means this and a certain type of literacy. Others feel like that if you want to go and make changes about certain types of things, you need to be able to do this, etc. So, you know, when I'm <laughs> assigning a paper or something like that, I'll say, you know, I, I care if you understand Durkheim's theory of blah, blah, blah. But also what I'm trying to figure out is if 
you can articulate what you understand and say it clearly and have a point. And, and it's those kind of skills, I think, and again, saying to students, that's what I'm doing and what I'm interested in. Um, and saying, whether you want to do this, that, or the other thing, you're going to need to be able to do this. Um, that, that's kind of where I try to keep. Okay. Yeah. 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 We are just about out of time. Um, we have the room, so please feel free to stick around and continue the conversation. Uh, please sign in. If you haven't signed in, please take coffee to go before they take it all out of here. Sorry. Uh, take, the, uh, <laughs> take, the, uh, take a photo if you like, and please join me in thanking Professor Kathy.